Well, thank you. We're going to move ahead, and uh, Dr. Reardon, you're going to tell us uh, about mechanical support now. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Alrighty, so um, we're going to talk about mechanical support options, and I think my disclosure slide fell out. Um, some of the work that I'm going to present here was supported by the ISHLT hardware grant for um, early investigators uh, for translational medicine um, in, in uh, transplant. So the number one cause of death in adult congenital heart disease is actually heart failure, as you can tell from some of the talks that you've just heard. Um, the peach sort of lines here represent heart failure. Um, the gray lines represent uh, sudden cardiac death from arrhythmias. And then uh, the red lines represent uh, post-operative early death. And I just gave grand rounds down at Hogue for anesthesia. And one of the major causes of death in adult congenital heart disease patients is um, perioperative complications associated with non-cardiac um, uh, procedures. So I think uh, one of the things that we always have to be mindful of somebody going for a laparoscopic procedure or some other uh, procedure is that they don't end up in a, in a situation where they run into problems because they don't have adequate support. So if you're between age uh, 18 and 39, then 10% then of the transplant recipients um, have congenital heart disease at this point. And that represents about 2.9% of all patients re, uh, receiving uh, heart transplants in the United States. So advanced heart failure and transplant patients in the United States in terms of congenital heart disease tend to be uh, younger. Uh, they tend to be more female than, than male. Um, they have longer wait lifts times, higher cardiovascular death rates, and lower transplant rates. The ischemic times, as you can imagine, with multiple sternotomies is much longer in congenital heart disease patients, 3.8 hours versus 2.9 hours. And there's a question, I mean, is, we don't see the same results in pediatric uh, congenital patients, and there may be just a survival advantage to being adult congenital. You made it to adulthood, and therefore you're going to maybe make it to a uh, transplant. Um, patients with uh, congenital heart disease are also less likely to get a VAD. They're more likely to require pre-transplant uh, ventilation, and they're more likely to be highly sensitized secondary to the surgeries and uh, the grafts that they've received as uh, children for their palliations. So the proportion of ACHD transplants that were supported with uh, mechanical support has increased since the 90s, and um, we're seeing the highest amount um, all the way up to 2002, which is the most available data that's been published in 2013. Um, as you can see, some uh, of these patients are getting bivads, about 7%, and some of them were getting TAHs, which has followed out of um, favor a little bit recently because of a lot of the thromboembolic complications with TAH. Some of our colleagues, Mel Melanie Everett and Angie Gateman, um, published this article um, not too long ago in the ISHLT journal, and they, they demonstrated that um, ACHD access to VAD support um, really is much lower. So you have a higher rate of cardiovascular death if you have congenital heart disease, about 60% versus 40%. The weight list mortality, surprisingly, in this study was not um, significantly different, and uh, fewer CHD patients, not surprisingly, actually achieved a heart transplant, 53% versus 65%. Because of the palliations that patients have, the single ventricle physiology, the need for um, sternotomies in order to place an AICD, you're less likely to have arrhythmogenic protection if you're a congenital patient, 44% versus 75% in the non-congenital population. So they conclude that you know, patients uh, who have congenital heart disease who have heart failure would more likely benefit from more AICDs. Um, but because of the risk of this, this is often uh, unfeasible and the access for VADs for selected patients may actually uh, improve outcomes. Unfortunately, AC ACHD patients are different um, than uh, patients without congenital heart disease. Oftentimes, we don't understand what palliations they've had despite our uh, advanced imaging technologies. Um, multiple, they've had multiple sternotomies and uh, thoracotomies, and they have other uh, comorbidities and antibodies. Patients have liver dysfunction, as we heard so eloquently earlier, as well as renal dysfunction and uh, poor nutritional status, which may actually be a really effective way of um, improving their nutritional status by giving them more time uh, prior to transplant with uh, mechanical circulatory support. So the patients who are really needing this MCS, and I think are sort of the early patients who are going to benefit from this type of therapy, are the patients with systemic right ventricles, particularly our, our congenitally corrected uh, transposition of the great artery, our uh, patients who have transposition of the great arteries and had a mustard or sinning procedure. 
Um, the RAPA Fontans are ones that we're also very interested in, obviously all Fontans, and then um, it makes it very difficult and problematic for our um, very creative surgeons when they have uh, complex venous reconstructions, as Dr. Billy Wally demonstrated, as well as residual shunts such as POTS, um, water stones, and BT shunts. Now, we, we think that VADs may actually provide a good survival benefit, particularly since so many patients die of an arrhythmia, um, and this may actually be a really great utilization of mechanical support is uh, having a way to temporize some of our arrhythmia problems. But fortunately, in Southern California, we tend to get um, organ offers a little bit earlier, and we actually get a lot of patients referred from other states and other um, uh, jurisdictions who have a lower rate of transplantation because of available organs. Um, and we tend to find ourselves being able to do a lot of micromanaging to prevent patients from maybe not necessarily needing a VAD, but I think that we need to be continuing to, to be creative and think about um, operative feasibility, bleeding issues, and size limitations. So there's been a handful of case reports of patients getting uh, ventricular assist devices. This is a heartware device that was uh, placed in uh, 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 Kentucky by Dr. Slaughter. Um, this was a 66-year-old who got a, a heartware device and subsequently uh, underwent transplantation. And I think that the, um, the anatomic differences are really what the surgeons have to uh, cope with. Here's another patient who, had, who was 49 who had situs inversus and also um, congenitally corrected transposition of the great arteries who had the heartware device implanted under the diaphragm into the systemic right ventricle. Um, uh, there, there's been theories about placing a TAH into a Fontan and very beautiful illustrations, but this is yet to be uh, accomplished. Our colleagues in uh, Newcastle, England, have presented, um, I think this was eight patients, uh, several of them, about half of them were bridged to destination, and uh, the other half were bridged to transplant. Two of them died of sepsis, three of them were transplanted, and two of them remained uh, bridged to destination. Now, when Dr. Lax talked about creativity, this was one of the uh, problems that this group actually faced. They placed uh, a hardware VAD into a systemic right ventricle, and as they were dissecting, they were hoping to place the VAD with, to the, uh, the graft to the aorta, but they weren't able to access the aorta, and they had to be creative and actually uh, attach the uh, outflow graft to the, the subclavian artery. Our um, uh, colleagues also in uh, Prague also presented a group of uh, five patients who also uh, went on to uh, transplant. Two of them had strokes, so um, thromboembolic complications from these devices is, continues to be a big problem. And they actually showed um, how they achieved some of these, um, uh, these procedures, achieved this with the, the devices that we have. And the devices were designed for patients who have normal anatomy. And so the twists and turns and the angles often uh, provide uh, uh, significant challenges for the surgical operation of these patients. So with the failing Fontan, is the road closed? And our hope is to break, th break that barrier down. And um, this was a, a very sort of notable article back in 2009 by Lamore and colleagues. And if the red line is patients going for transplant who don't have Fontans, who are congenital, and patients with Fontans, and the mortality was significantly different, um, we've seen a, a better survival in our adult Fontan patients who end up getting transplanted, at least here at UCLA. And we're trying to, to sort of bring together uh, multi-center data in order to better understand uh, what makes somebody a better transplant candidate than somebody else. There are also a couple uh, uh, centers who have actually done uh, VADs in single ventricle patients, but these were primarily for patients who had systolic ventricular failure. So the um, very nice lecture that uh, Dr. Lin presented with the failing Fontan physiology is more of a right-sided failure with um, ascites, PLE, um, and lower extreme edema. So Putting a VAD within the, uh, the, the, when you have normal systolic function might ne not necessarily solve those problems. So this was an 11-year-old patient who was a single ventricle who had a heartware device placed. Um, he had the device for 148 days and survived a transplant. I actually met him at the ISHLT in San Diego about three years ago, and he's doing great. Um, this was actually just published uh, here in 2017 where they, um, uh, in Milwaukee, put VADs into three patients, um, all of them with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Um, all of them had, again, systolic uh, heart failure um, of the single ventricle, and they all went on to uh, transplant. 
There's a single case of right-sided support that uh, Dr. Morales um, and Pietra also, also published in 2008 where they placed a um, Berlin heart within the uh, Fontan um, and anastomosed it to the pulmonary artery as Dr. Alax alluded to. Um, he, I think he took his slide out to not steal my thunder, but um, it's a, it was a very creative thing. The patient uh, had support for 13 months and underwent transplant shortly after that. Now our group here um, uh, first started by placing uh, uh, in a pig model a, a Jarvik axial flow device uh, within an extra cardiac Fontan model and demonstrated that we were able to improve uh, cardiac output and reduce uh, Fontan pressure when a VAD was started. And we then uh, proposed to do this with another uh, more commercially available centrifugal device, uh, more notably the, the Heartware HVAD, and received some funding support from the ISHLT to, to perform these um, experiments. So we ended up developing two models, and I'll show you um, the creativity that ended up um, allowing us to do two different models. So the first model was the extra cardiac Fontan model, and then we did sort of the more classic RA to PA Fontan model, and we took four pigs. Um, and, and was able to do two experiments for each type of model. Here's a uh, diagram uh, that was uh, illustrated by my colleague, Dr. Abelholson here, showing the extra cardiac Fontan model. And in the inferior portion of the Fontan, the hardware device is uh, placed um, and, and was, it was inserted and we were able to uh, mimic this uh, physiology, failing physiology. So here are so just some pictures of Dr. Lax and Dr. Benawali um, creating the extra cardiac Fontan and then the placement once the Fontan was initiated. And what we showed was that once the Fontan was um, uh, placed, not, not unexpectedly, the cardiac output dropped precipitously from about 3.5 um, liters per minute down to one, uh, one and a half liters per minute. And once the, Fontan, once the hardware HVAD device was started, the uh, cardiac output um, returned to normal or actually um, much better. And, the uh, IVC pressures, which was technically the pressures within the Fontan, um, uh, shot up once the Fontan was initiated up to about 12 to 13. And then once the, fat, the VAD was able to offload the Fontan, the uh, pressures came down. Now mid, um, after we completed the first uh, procedure, the, the, the animal heart was having uh, ventricular arrhythmias. We gave him some lidocaine and took down the extra cardiac Fontan and the hearts uh, re resumed beating. And Dr. Lax sort of started playing with the uh, baffles that we were using for the extra cardiac Fontan. He cut it at an angle and started poking holes in it and was talking about more of a classic RA to PA Fontan, made an incision in the, um, uh, the right atrial appendage with Dr. Benawali and inserted it um, into the right atrial appendage and was able to resume uh, mechanical support. So what we thought was, well, if we can, is there a way to create a cannula that can be inserted within the Fontan that would overcome the suction force that is caused by the, uh, the mechanical uh, device and prevent the wall of the Fontan to being sucked into the device? So um, our uh, research associates, um, Abby and uh, Rachel, actually did a 3D print with an engineering uh, student of uh, a, a cannula that we then inserted um, in this model into a RA to PA Fontan. And the way that we created this model was that Dr. Lax and Dr. Benwelli defunctionalized the tricuspid valve and then clamped the main pulmonary artery. The uh, inflow cannula that was then inserted through the right atrial appendage and the outflow cannula was anastomosed to the pulmonary artery. Um, and so here's a echo picture of the cannula within the Fontan. And similarly, here's some couple pictures of um, the Fontan inserted in there and inserted in such a way that, that the chest could be closed. And finally, um, the hemodynamics were quite similar to what we saw with the extra cardiac Fontan model where the uh, cardiac output was in the three to 3.5 uh, range prior to initiation of the Fontan circuit as the uh, tricuspid valve was defunctionalized and we had severe TR and the um, uh, ma main pulmonary artery was clamped. The, uh, cardiac output precipitously fell um, in the third animal that it almost fell to zero. Then the HVAD was initiated and the uh, cardiac output, at least in the first model, went up to five and in the second model went up to about 3.5 and continued. And then we actually tried different speeds of the, um, of the uh, device and tried to, to make sure that we weren't in training air into the system. Here's also that surrogate looking at the Fontan pressures. 
Um, the Fontan pressure shot up in the first model and then decreased as we initiated the pump. Um, for some reason, we didn't see that same uh, increase in, in the IVC pressure with um, uh, the second model, but I wonder if we just had sort of an erroneous measurement at that time. So the future of applying these VADs to um, congenital heart disease, again, takes the creativity that Dr. Lack so eloquently described. Here are some pictures of a lot of VADs that are being developed for pediatric patients. Um, um, there's very tiny uh, Jarvik models here. The thing that I'm, the, the VAD that I'm really interested in is the one on the top. Um, it's called the Longhorn, where the base of the, um, of the VAD actually sits within the apex of the LV, and the uh, metal portion of the VAD actually sits across the aortic valve. And what we see here is that this sits across the aortic valve, and this would be in the, um, in the aorta. And if there's a way to re-engineer this where the side arm of the base is taken off to at a 90 degree angle that potentially this could be placed within, this, in, within the um, conduit of a Fontana and provide one to three liters of support and maybe prevent the right side of symptoms and failing Fontan uh, physiology that we see. So there's still a lot, on the, a lot of things that we have to try and the thromboembolic complications are one of the biggest things that we'll have to overcome. And thank you to my team. I think there's one more. Uh, our team. <laughs> um, and it's, it's really, truly a privilege to work with such um, caring and creative and thoughtful people. Thanks so much.